so Campbell wasn't joking. The last slide that I have is uh, went missing. It was thank you for listening. <laughs> so he said only thank them if they listened. <laughs> so everybody dares to be loved for who they are. And what gets in the way of that is the voices in people's head uh, from past experiences and hurts of the past and early childhood and all sorts of things that have happened. So I work with people to regain confidence and to believe in who they are, to be able to dare to be. You all know that I run singles events. Today I'd like to talk to you about the personal coaching that I do in helping people improve their relationships. A bit about me. Family has been very important throughout my life. I'm the eldest of five children and these are my two sisters and their beautiful nieces, uh, my, my nieces, their daughters. And we, are, we have two beautiful sons, four grandchildren. That's my mum, who's four foot 11, produced five children, amazing. And my mother-in-law, who's the cheekiest woman I know. Um, that's us and that's us having our 46th wedding anniversary dinner in New Zealand on New Year's Eve just recently. So 46 years married, you think, oh, it's all been peaches and cream. Of course it never is, is it? The greatest challenge that we experienced was in my mid-twenties crisis when I went through a whole stage of going, why am I here, Where am I, what am I doing, um, our relationships not working. So I left Michael for three weeks. <laughs> I went to Perth, my parents had moved over there and he announced he was going skiing. And at that point I went, oh, I'm going to lose him. Ah, he's going to meet somebody. So, oh, I'm coming back. Well, fortunately, he took me back and uh, the rest is history. But we had counselling and we did a lot of work on our relationship after that. And that led to major life decisions. In fact, what we did was we sold our architect design home that we'd just built and lived in for a year at 18.5% interest with a personal land loan on top of that. You can imagine the pressure we were under financially and I wanted to have children and I'd never travelled. So the major decision we made was sell the house and go overseas. So we travelled for a year. We bought and sold a camper van, toured 17 countries around Europe and had the year of our lives. In fact, I say that is the year that we grew up. And we came back, it was now our ninth year of marriage and we were ready to have children. In fact, I'd made, well, we made Reese in Austria, I always say, he was made in Austria. Uh, it was just at the end of the year I came back, I was pregnant. Our life has been revolved around uh, sport a lot. Uh, I've always had sport in my life. Oh, I forgot to say, um, the best thing that happened was we became empty nesters and Michael said to me once, why don't you take up golf? And I went, oh, why would I do that? He said, because we can do that together and, you know, when we're travelling, whatever. I went, okay. So I got a few girlfriends learning and all their husbands said, what are you thinking, asking these women to take up golf? Uh, he said, you just wait and see. And he was right. I'm more addicted to golf than he is. I'm the one saying, let's go play. Um, I, other men, you know, don't have that luxury, do they? They have to feel guilty about going and playing. So if you're looking for us on a Sunday, that's where we are, out in the golf course. From my career in education, now don't hang me as a um, fluffy, airy, artsy music teacher. I was anything but. I spent my time as mu in music creating opportunities to take kids overseas. Toured Singapore, New Zealand, took 65 kids, um, you know, every, pretty much that and more to everywhere we went and, you know, around Australia as well as overseas. Gave them the best experience, but you can imagine for me, what it gave me was the opportunity to learn to know them and understand them at a much deeper level when you take them out of the classroom and overseas and into new experiences, pro solving problems, performing all around. I had a wonderful, diverse experience. You can imagine I started at Kingston High, which was low socioeconomic. My first five years of teaching were there. And that was a lesson in human behaviour, uh, broken families. If you were lucky, um, you know, if they were lucky, they had two parents. And if they were unlucky, in a way, they were actually um, part of a whole abusive situation. So it was my um, pleasure to really help those kids and make their life 
something special when they came into the classroom and everything that the opportunities that I provided them. Then I went to Mansfield, the Silver Spoon School. <laughs> Mansfield's like the opposite polar end of what Kingston is like. And those kids just didn't really appreciate anything. Um, it was really yin and yang for me and I wasn't that happy there. Fortunately, I was pregnant and left. Um, then came back a few years later and worked at McGregor High for 15 years and had the best time in the Head of Performing Arts, all of the tours and camps and lots of experience there. McGregor's a diverse population of um, multicultural, uh, high energy. The parents got involved in anything we were doing. They were prepared to help me raise money for musical instruments. They came on tour, they had, came on camps and they volunteered. Um, even to help my workload in, in the, my staff room with everything I was organising. Perfect deputy role was Creative Industries Academy. There's three wonderful academies and that one is for gifted kids in um, the arts. So I got to work in that academy for a number, number of years. Contrast to Calumvale Community College as senior school principal. Unbelievable difference, um, chasing kids around the park <laughs> from tru truanting, uh, dealing with school refusal, helping parents with their kids and their ADHD, their oppositional defiance, their, um, you know, all sorts of conditions, OCD, all sorts of um, adversities. But that is the absolute pleasure that I got out of working more personally with families and getting to understand human behaviours and helping people transform where they are at. Transition to life coaching began, began in 2019. I have, that list is, goes down further. I've done just about every modality you can do and my toolkit is full. So I'm able to help people at an unconscious mind level, which is where it really makes a difference. I'll tell you about Jack and Jill. That's not their names, of course. Um, and that shows my age, Jack and Jill. Who was at school when Jack and Jill was one of the first books we read? Um, Jack and Jill... Uh, they had communication issues. She said, if he doesn't change, I'm out, I've had enough. He said, nothing I ever do is good enough, what's the point? They, they'd completely lost connection. They couldn't remember their last date night. They couldn't, hadn't had sex for God knows how long, it was way too long. And they had no trust in each other and what they, how invested or not that they were into the relationship. So what I do is, firstly, I want to know how committed they are to wanting to make this work so I have an individual conversation with them and really gain understanding of what do they actually love about that person that they're married to and what do they appreciate because often they've forgotten that and even that conversation is an interesting one. Um, what are they prepared to do to make things better? And are they committed to the long game? I need to know that to be able to help them. And if they're sounding dodgy about it, then we can still go through a whole process which helps them make the decision. Because ultimately, the decision to make it work is half the battle. You're either going to be committed or not. What happens trans uh, fast forward is they've found themselves again. They are now creating their dream time. They are restored in, you know, having fun together. And they've taken up, not golf, but <laughs> other things that are of interest to them uh, with their boating and things. So interesting to look at the transformation. But what makes a difference is Jack and Jill both individually believe in themselves. They understand their own strengths and they can appreciate the differences in each other and be able to um, value that. Because when both people bring their strengths to a relationship and are willing to give over the leadership to that strength to that partner, there isn't that, um, what's, what would you call it, that um, tug, of tug of war about who's in charge of anything. It's, um, you know, I just organised our tour around New Zealand and we had two weeks of absolute delight. Michael just came along for the ride and I was glad because I got to choose what we did. I, of course, chose things I knew he wanted to do and it was a dream holiday. But that's where I come in because that's my experience with tours and things that I've done before. Oh, this is a little bit skewed. Um, so, 
as, just to summarise, it's about discovering potential, knowing why you're in the relationship and being prepared to, um, you know, believe in who you are and each of you to allow you to be who you are and then transforming the core issues that sit underneath the conversations because those triggers, those arguments are often something that isn't about what's actually happened right then. It's a whole lot of stuff that sits under the surface and that's the beautiful work that I love doing with people. Decisions to make, for better or worse, are we in the game? Are we committed? Is it worth investing? Are we going to put what we can into this relationship and will I let go? Will I? Because sometimes that's a choice people don't want to make. They want to hang on to what's gone on in the past and they can't forgive. And that's a lot of the work is um, I run workshops in uh, forgiveness, letting go, um, taking charge and opening the heart. And can I allow myself to be loved? Because that, that's part of, you know, finding love starts with you, loving you. And can I allow myself to therefore, once I feel lovable, um, love somebody else, let them in? Oh, that's it. Thank you for listening. That was actually pretty quick. Ah. <laughs> yes. As I said, the other slide went missing. Deb, you mentioned to me once you, you understand a man's brain. I do. Like you're a man's, I, a man I've brain. always, yeah, yeah, so I went to school at a co-ed. Um, we had, I went to the girls' school, we had the boys' school. I did all the subjects at the boys' school and hung out with the boys. <laughs> because I always find that boys are easy to talk to. I get them. I've got the two sons. I've grown up in uh, my cousins, my favourite cousin family. There's uh, nine boys and a girl. I always wanted to have ten. I just get men and I feel for them <laughs> because we women are very, very hard on our men, aren't we, women? We are critical, we expect them to be perfect and we knock them down so much that they forget who they are. So then we want, we expect them to be something better than they are but we've knocked them down so how can they? They give up. So I just love helping okay. men. I helping men. I love helping men believe in who they are, and making them feel okay. I'm totally judgment free. Nothing through all my experience, believe me, nothing would shock me. With Jack and Jill, what was the time frame? Uh, they so it isn't long.